Well, welcome everyone to our October edition of the Second Friday Lecture Series. My name is Doug Dahman here at the Civil War Museum, and we're very thankful to have Phil Angelo with us today. Phil has agreed to do the program uh, via Zoom, as you can tell. So we welcome him um, virtually to the museum today. And I just want to say another word of thanks, not only to Phil, but also to our sponsor for these um, Second Friday Lectures, a sponsor that has been with us since the very beginning uh, of the Civil War Museum, the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable and Iron Brigade Association. Um, their support allows us to host these Second Friday Lecture programs, as well as other public programs uh, throughout the year. So we thank them for their continued support of our museum and of our public programming. Uh, today we have Phil Angelo, who's going to do a program for us entitled Two Civil Wars. And it's going to uh, encompass a stories about a second civil war occurring concurrently with the American Civil War um, in North America, this one being in Mexico. Phil is a retired newspaper editor. He currently lives in Kankakee, Illinois. He's had a long time affiliation with a number of Civil War roundtables in Illinois. And he's been researching Civil War topics since the centennial. He uh, has the goal every year, he, he informed me this morning, of researching and putting together a presentation on at least one Civil War topic every year. Uh, Phil has been gracious enough to share a couple of different programs with us at the museum. And we're grateful that he's joining us today. So Phil, thank you so much for agreeing to do the program for us. Thank, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, listening throughout the nation. God bless. Let's have let's have a good time. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Phil. Poor Mexico, so far from God and so near to the United States. Porfirio Diaz, ruler of Mexico from 1876 to 1911, summed up the relationship between the two countries with that pithy stay, saying. While Americans do not study Mexican history, be assured that Mexicans study ours. While Americans are not conscious of what happens in Mexican politics, Mexicans are very conscious of what happens in American politics. From 1861 to 1865, we had our civil war. At nearly the same time, from 1862 to 1867, Mexico had a civil war spawned by an intervention from France. In all probability, if we had not had our civil war at the time, Mexico would not have had their war at the same time. And if ours had turned out differently, theirs may have turned out differently too. This is a story of a disaster and a tragedy. It was a war that helped cross the emperor of France's throne. It weakened the emperor of Austria it cost the emperor of Mexico his life. The official death toll in Mexico was 25,000. Unofficially, no one will ever know what the total death toll was because there were a, a guerrilla war and atrocities on both sides. It is worth noting that at the outbreak of the civil war in this country, US Secretary of State William Seward thought that one way to resolve the dispute would be for both sides to simply unite the United States and Confederate States and invade Mexico jointly. We treated Mexico like a step stool and the Mexicans knew it. Some background here. Mexico had been the jewel of the Spanish empire. It was their most popular populous colony before it gained its independence. It was also the wealthiest colony in the Spanish empire. An 11 year war from 1810 to 1821 created Mexican independence. In 1800, the Catholic church owned half the land in Mexico. The population consisted of one sixth Creoles. Those were people of Spanish descent born in Mexico. One sixth Mestizos, people of mixed Indian Spanish descent and two thirds indigenous population or Indians. It was a world where class divisions meant a lot and where class hatreds were strong. For 40 years in Mexico, before 1860, there have been struggles. 
Landowners, Catholics, and Creoles were generally on one side, with liberals, Indians, and mestizos on the other. Mexico had had 73 presidents in 40 years. It was obviously a time of great instability. Let's talk a little bit about the cast of characters. Porfirio Diaz was the general grant of the French intervention in Mexico, fighting on the Mexican side. Born in 1830, he had trained for the priesthood, changed his mind, and volunteered to fight. He became a Freemason. He married his sister's daughter, his own niece. She died from complications after giving birth to their seventh child. He fought throughout the war rising from brigade command to division command to army command. He was twice captured and twice escaped. The French tried to bribe him to get him to change sides to their side. Maximilian I, the Austrian, a tall man, 6'2", of fair complexion with a sort of reddish round blonde hair. Intelligent, he knew seven languages. He was devoted to his older brother, Franz Joseph. And if that name is familiar to you, Franz Joseph would rule Austria-Hungary until 1916, deep into World War I. There were, there were rumors that he was a bastard, which would have made him Napoleon's grandson. He combed his beard in an odd, odd parted style. As you can see here, he was blue-eyed, described as a sort of dreamy man. He lived in Miramar, a romantic castle near Venice. His bedroom was built to resemble the cabin of a ship and was filled with portraits of his ancestors. He once wrote 27 rules of conduct. Never let the mind rule the body. Do not use any obscenity. Never mock religion never talk with servants. He did love money. He was a greedy person. He haggled to get a larger dowry from his wife's family. He was devoutly Catholic. For some reason, it was popular to offer Maximilian thrones. Before he took the throne of Mexico, he had been considered for the throne of Poland and for the throne of Greece. He was a hard worker, starting every day at 4 a.m., went riding at 9, Breakfast, went riding at 7, breakfast at 9, back in bed by 8 p.m. He did not like evening balls and dances. He did, unfortunately, visit prostitutes and contracted syphilis, which left him uh, unable to, uh, to have a child. He loved to tell risque stories. He usually wore a simple gray coat, but designed an ornate medal for the Mexican Order of Guadalupe, which he frequently wore. By all accounts, he was friendly, good-natured, kindly, and ambitious. He was 31 when he took the throne of Mexico. His wife was Carlotta, Belgium, Charlotte, born when her mother was 38 and her father was 50, seven years younger than Maximilian, an attractive woman. She could be charming and friendly. Those who knew both described her as the better half. Although Maximilian sometimes waffled about taking the throne, she was ambitious and lobbied him to accept. She spoke Spanish, French, German, and English. Napoleon III, ruler of France. Napoleon had come to power ruling France in 1851. For our purposes, what is useful to know is that he had a desire to make France a worldwide power. He waged war in the Crimea, invaded Italy, supported canals at Suez and Panama. In two efforts that would prove disastrous to France, he invaded both Vietnam and Mexico. His wife, the Empress Eugenie, like Maximilian, she was the more colorful and powerful and ambitious of the couple. Deeply religious and pious, she had been educated in a Paris convent. In 1835, when she was only nine, she witnessed a revolution where a liberal mob 
had repeatedly stabbed an old monk outside her bedroom window. For her, revolution meant bloodshed, and she, she was deeply conservative. At 17, following a love affair, she tried to commit suicide by swallowing match heads. Following a hunting party with Napoleon III, Napoleon III, the emperor, fell head over heels in love with her. She insisted upon marriage rather than becoming one of his many mistresses. The, to the surprise of everyone, Napoleon conceded and went on to marry her. She was a cigar smoker and took much of the blame for the Mexican adventurer. Mexican conservatives lobbied Eugene as a way of getting to Napoleon III. Princess Sam Sam, the Kardashian of her times. In every era, we have people like the Kardashians who are somehow famous for being famous without accomplishing too much of anything. Such a person during the Civil War was Agnes Elizabeth Winona Leclerc Joy, born in tiny Franklin, Vermont, on the border with Canada. She was only 16 when the Civil War broke out. She was a trapeze circus performer, which was then an erotic profession because men in the audience could look up the skirts of the trapeze performers. She caught the eye of Prince Felix Samsam, a man nearly twice her age. Felix, a German from Prussia, was a member of the staff of Louis Blenker on, of the Army of the Potomac. Blenker, himself a German from Westphalia, was a brigade commander. The princess accepted her man, accepted, accompanied her man to the front and stayed with the Army of the Potomac throughout the war. After the war, Prince Samson went south to Mexico to fight for Maximilian, and he was later captured in the ending phases of the war. Benito Juarez, the hero of the story. Benito is as revered in Mexico as Lincoln or Washington is in the United States. He spoke only his tribal language of Zapotecan until he was six or seven. Both of his parents by, died by the time he was five. He was brought up by an uncle who taught him Spanish. He was a short man, five foot. When he was 12, he ran away 40 miles to the home of his sister, who was a domestic servant. Her employer, a Creole merchant, merchant, arranged for Juarez to live with a Dominican monk. He went on to learn Latin and French but was not interested in the priesthood. He was encouraged to become an attorney, which he did, and he joined the Liberal Party. He was fond of cigars. He married when he was 37 and his wife was 17. He was the father of 12 and a devoted parent. His wife said of him, he is very homely, but very good. A middle-class lawyer and a professional man, he never dressed as an Indian or a military man. He always wore a starched white shirt. Juarez is very much regarded as the Lincoln of his country. Of both Lincoln and Juarez, it might be written, they were despised and rejected by men and men of sorrows and acquainted with grief in their lives. Like George Washington in the American Revolution, Juarez simply refused to give up. He wrote, show me the highest and driest mountain and I will go to the top of it and die there, wrapped in the flag of the Mexican Republic, but without leaving the national territory, never. In 1857, he became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Mexico, which at that time made him the Vice President of the country. The War of the Reform, which was raging just as our Civil War was about to begin. Mexico in the mid 19th century was a land deeply divided between conservatives and liberals. The conservatives, shown here in the map in blue, included the Catholic clergy, landowners, the military, and most of those of Spanish descent. 
they dominated the rural part of the country. The liberals shown in red, including most, were mostly of Indian descent. In 1854, a liberal manifesto was promulgated aimed at disestablishing the Catholic Church and establishing freedom of religion. Another key goal of the liberals was to remove the dictator, Santa Anna. By 1857, Santa Anna was gone. Four presidents followed in rapid succession. When Ignacio Comanfort resigned without selecting a successor, Benito Juarez, again, who was the vice president, became president. What followed was a bitter war where both sides shot prisoners. Conservatives funded their troops through church contributions and by selling church candlesticks. The liberals partly funded their side of the war by confiscating foreign owned property in Mexico. Juarez and the liberals won triumphantly entering Mexico City, January 11th, 1861. An immediate worldwide crisis was precipitated when the liberal Mexican government under Juarez refused to honor foreign debts that had been run up by conservative presidents. Britain, Spain, and France responded by sending a fleet to Veracruz, Mexico to get money from the Mexicans. France did not tell the other participants that it wanted more than money. The total debt was $89 million to England 9 million to Spain and 2.8 million to France. France was not the major debtor. Matthias Romero, the Mexican ambassador to Washington, negotiated a deal with Secretary of State William Seward. The United States would have assumed Mexico's international debt for a 3% charge and a mortgage on Mexico's silver mines and public lands. Just imagine that, we would have gotten a mortgage on Mexico's silver mines. This agreement was rejected by the European powers. There was also a particular problem with landing in Veracruz. Oh, one side too many. On the Caribbean coast of Mexico. It was one of the least healthy places on earth. Home of yellow fever, known as the vomito, which would kill one third of any European station there. Napoleon III knew that once the troops were in Veracruz, there would be immense pressure to move forward. The European Allied force landed in Veracruz January 8, 1862. France also kept upping the ante, asking for more and more money, 10 million, then 20 million, to keep the Mexicans from accepting. The other participants, notably Britain, negotiated agreements and withdrew. That spring, a French army of 6,500 men advanced into central Mexico. On May 5th, 1862, the French launched a series of attacks against 4,500 Mexicans dug in at Puebla. The French, overconfident, launched a series of frontal attacks. The third onslaught went in without any artillery support. The Mexicans repelled them all. Then a charge by 650 Mexican Lancers turned the French retreat into a rout. Juarez immediately issued a proclamation May 9th calling for a celebration of the day. This is the event celebrated still today as Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo is not Mexican Independence Day. It is also not a national holiday in Mexico, although it is a day, day off from school. It is, in a sense, the Lexington and Concord of Mexico, the battle that showed the world that Mexico would resist imperialism and would not easily be defeated. Napoleon III reacted to the initial defeat with determination. He changed commanders and raised the number of French troops, first to 18,000 and eventually to 40,000. On May 26, 1863, in the Second Battle of Puebla, a French army of 26,000 took the city after a 62-day siege.
One month later, in June 1863, the French occupied the capital. Juarez then made two critical decisions. The Mexicans dispersed their remaining army of 15,000 men rather than see it defeated and went on to fight a guerrilla war. The Mexicans preferred to use irregular cavalry while the French fought in infantry formations. Each won the phase of the war that it preferred. But Mexican mobility was critical. The departure of the regular Mexican army into guerrilla units drew nothing but contempt from the French. The war played out much as our war in Vietnam played out. The French controlled the major cities, the Mexicans controlled the countryside. Juarez made the guerrilla war more brutal by declaring that any Mexican who sided with the French forfeited their life. The French answered by founding a counter guerrilla operation led by Colonel Charles Louis Dupont. The counter guerrillas were the toughest outfit in the French army, much like our Green Beret. It was a savage war. In one case, liberals tied a landowner to a tree while they disemboweled his pregnant wife. The landowner survived to tell the French. As he pointed out the guerrillas, they were promptly hanged. Dupin said he was merciful. He always hanged men by the neck while the guerrillas hung them upside down by their feet. Every Mexican, he said, is either a guerrilla or has been one or will be one, so it will do no harm to shoot those we catch. The Foreign Legion. We now have to say a bit about the Mexican experience of the French Foreign Legion because France's intervention in Mexico proved to be the site of their most famous battle. Recruits to the French Foreign Legion still sign their enlistment papers under a picture of the Battle of Cameroon. On April 30th, 1863, Captain Jean Danjou, a Crimean war veteran who had lost one hand when a Mexican exploded, was leading 70, 65 legionnaires on a patrol. They were attacked in overwhelming force by liberal guerrilla cavalry. The legionnaires formed a square and unleashed a volley that stunned their opponents. They then doubled quick 200 yards to a hacienda which they converted into a fortress. Several times the Mexicans sent over requests to surrender. Here it is hard to separate legend from fact. When one request to surrender came over, the story says, the answer was, the legion dies, the legion does not surrender. Another request to surrender was met by merde, the French word for shit. By 6 p.m., only five men were left with one round of ammunition apiece. Two were wounded. They fired their last volley and prepared to die. The Mexicans surrounded them and prepared to bayonet them when a Mexican colonel hesitated. We will surrender, Captain Louis Main of the legend said, Legion said if you will leave us our arms and treat our lieutenant who is wounded. The Mexican colonel looked at the five legionnaires who were alive and he asked, is this all? Assured that it was, he said, these are not men, these are demons. Even today, the French Foreign Legion, wherever it is posted, celebrates the Battle of Cameroon. The wooden hand of Danjou, his wooden prosthesis, is still preserved in a special casket. It is brought out every April 30th in a special ceremony at Legion headquarters and saluted. Mexico is very much a part of the history of the Legion. It has the same honor, distinction, legend as the Alamo might have here. Napoleon III also came very close to simply giving the French Foreign Legion to Maximilian. On July 10th, 1863, a council of notables, a group of conservatives from Mexico appointed by the French army, offered the throne to Maximilian by a vote of 222 to nine. Maximilian waffled for a long time before accepting. He talked with Pope Pius IX and with King Leopold of Belgium and came to the conclusion that he would do it if he could get France to supply him with troops. 
He also wanted the Mexican people to genuinely accept him. The U.S. consul warned him that one day the civil war in the United States would be over, and one day Napoleon III would fall in France. The French extended their control throughout late 1863 and into early 1864 and held a dummy referendum, a fake election, to convince Maximilian. The ostensible vote was 6.4 million for Maximilian out of a total population of 8.6 million. In cases where the French controlled a province, they simply counted the entire population as being for Maximilian. Still, up to two days before leaving Europe, Maximilian was uncertain. On April 10th, 1864, he departed from Trieste near Venice. He was attired in a full blue dress uniform of the Austrian Navy. From his ship, Maximilian wrote to Juarez asking for cooperation. Juarez refused any cooperation with the invading French and the conservatives. He wrote, it is given to men, sir, to attack the rights of others, to attempt the lives of those who defend their own liberty, and to make of their virtues a crime and of their vices a virtue. But there is one thing which is beyond the reach of perversity. That is the tremendous verdict of history. History will judge us, Juarez wrote. Now about Matamoros, Mexico. From 1862 to 1865, Matamoros was one of the busiest places on earth. The border between Mexico and the Confederate States of America was the Rio Grande River, with Matamoros on the south side of the river and Brownsville, Texas on the north side of the river. Before the war, the average shipping, shipping traffic there was one ship a year. During the war, the average was 300 ships a year. It was perfectly legal to ship goods from Europe, or for that matter, from the northern states to Matamoros, Mexico, because it was outside the blockade. Then you could move the goods over the Rio Grande River to Texas. Cotton moved the other way. Cotton could be in Texas, moved across the Rio Grande to Matamoros, and then shipped out. The Mexicans called it Los Algodones, the time of cotton. The population of Matamoros grew from 7,000 in 1862 to 50,000 by 1865. One writer said there were restaurants without number, saloons, gambling houses, and brothels. By 1864, Matamoros had an English language newspaper. If it would have been a Confederate city after New Orleans was captured, it would have been second in size only to Richmond. At one time in 1864, there were four armies, French, Warista, Union, and Confederate, all operating in the same vicinity of Mexico and Texas. It was an incredible place. France and Britain both sent warships to Matamoros to the mouth of the Rio Grande to keep the trade open. In October 1863, realizing the depth of the Confederate Mexican trade, the Union occupied the Texas side of the river with 7,000 troops, taking Brownsville, Texas without firing a shot. This, however, did not have the desired effect. The trade merely shifted upriver to Eagle Pass. The Union troops then pushed troops 100 miles west, only again with the effect of moving the trade further inland. On July 20th, 1864, Union forces pulled out of Brownsville, Texas, making it easier for the Confederates. That pullout was part of the effort to ship additional troops to U.S. Grant for his war in the Overland Campaign in Virginia. The trade, the Texas trade across the Rio Grande was immensely beneficial to the Confederates, but it did operate under several handicaps. First is there was no railroad that linked Brownsville to the rest of the Confederacy. It was 300 miles to the next railhead. Much of the route was semi-arid desert called the Sands, an area full of mesquite, prickly pear, tarantulas, scorpions, ticks, and fleas. 
it was a four to six week wagon haul to get the supplies from the Rio Grande to where the Confederacy could actually use them. But this trade was highly profitable. Here is an example from 1864. A man buys 2,000 bales of cotton at $100 a bale Confederate money. If he gets that across the border from Texas to Mexico, he ships it out. If he can get it to New York, he gets $400 a bale US currency for a nifty sum of $800,000 in greenbacks. If he then turn, turns those into goods and runs the blockade again, getting the goods back to Metamoros and back into Texas, he can then sell the goods for roughly 5 million Confederate. His initial 200,000 makes him a profit of about 5 million, which is a lot even in depreciated Confederate money. money. Normally sums like this attract government interest. The Mexicans tried to make money through tariffs raising the fee to as high as $20 on a bale of cotton. But the border was simply too long and too porous to stop any smuggling. When you think of it, a friendly Mexico would have been a really big help to the Confederacy. Other than the Union, it was the only country that bordered the South. An unfriendly Mexico meant total Confederate isolation. It was unfortunate for the Confederacy that the Mexicans had clear memories of the recent Mexican-American War. Such prominent Confederates as Alexander Stevens, John Slidell, Howell Cobb, and Judah P. Benjamin were on record favoring complete annexation of Mexico and exploitation of its resources. Both Toombs and Benjamin were Confederate secretaries of state. Jefferson Davis himself had been tremendously proud of his role in leading the Mississippi Rifles against the Mexicans during the, the Mexican-American War. Texas had more than 20,000 citizens of Mexican descent in 1861. Not surprisingly, evidence in, indicates that those Americans of Mexican descent voted overwhelmingly against secession. Both the Confederacy and the North sent diplomats to Juarez but the North sent a far more abler man. Thomas Corwin, an abolitionist from Ohio, was immensely popular in Mexico because he had opposed the Mexican War. The Confederate minister to Mexico was John T. Pickett, who was simply incompetent. Pickett was related, yes, to George Pickett of Gettysburg fame. He had been a general in the Hungarian army, had served in filibustering recognitions, filibustering expeditions in Latin America. Pickett had once been the U.S. Consul in Veracruz. When asked if his business was to get the Confederacy recognized, he insulted the Mexicans. No, my business is to recognize Mexico, providing a government, I can find a government that will stand long enough. When warned that Mexican liberals might join the Union Army as officers, he said they should worry about being captured because they would find themselves usefully employed for the first time in their lives. He threatened and implied an extension of slavery. Simply put, Pickett was no diplomat and he had racist views, which he freely communicated to the Mexicans. Conquer or negotiate. The Confederates tried to expand westward. The, there was a Confederate expedition under J, General H.H. H. Sibley to invade New Mexico, which occurred early in 1862, and they launched an invasion from West Texas up into New Mexico. Their aim was to conquer not only New Mexico, Arizona, and California for the Confederates, but also states within Mexico. These were pretty lofty goals. Not surprisingly, again, Mexican Americans in New Mexico almost unanimously sided with the Union. All of this came to naught, however, when the Sibley Calm was defeated by Union forces at Glorieta Pass. Throughout all of this, Lincoln was very cautious not to antagonize French by be France by being too close to Juarez. Matthias Romero, representing the Juarez government in Washington, 
asked for a loan from the United States to buy arms and was refused. Even when he raised enough money privately to buy 36,000 muskets for Mexico, U.S. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton seized the arms and declared them needed for the Union cause. On November 21st, 1862, Lincoln signed a proclamation prohibiting all arms exports from the Union for the duration of the war. Diplomatically, most European governments recognized Maximilian as the leader of Mexico. The exception was England. The US did not recognize Maximilian. There was sort of an unwritten agreement that if the United States remained neutral in regard to the war in Mexico, that France would not recognize the Confederacy, even though France leaned in that direction. But while both France and the United States were coy, it's worth noting that the Confederates offered to form an alliance with France in late 1862 and pledged support for Maximilian. Maximilian toyed with the idea of recognizing the Confederacy, but was talked out of it. Maximilian once wrote that the success of the Confederacy was linked to the success of his own government in Mexico. Lincoln and Stanton, again, were very cautious. On May 27th, 1864, Maximilian landed in Veracruz. The reception there was chilly, but it was warmer in Puebla, a conservative town. The population there rallied to his side. They, he was greeted later by 100,000 people in Mexico City shouting, long live the emperor. The royal couple moved to Chapultepec Castle. He tried to reform the Mexican army, but got nowhere because he had no money to pay the troops. His heart was not in the war. He sent two of his most cruel but most effective Mexican generals abroad on diplomatic missions to get them out of the country. Carlotta insisted upon the removal of the cutthroat Dupin and Maximilian assented. To the aggravation of French generals, Maximilian often commuted the death sentences of the guerrillas that reached him. Maximilian himself called the conservative Mexican landowners crabs. His gestures were futile. Maximilian and the French would never be tolerated by the liberals, but they in turn were too liberal for the conservatives. Still, by 1864, Maximilian and his allies controlled 20 of the 24 states in Mexico. Juarez only controlled 7% of the population. Juarez, however, never lost faith while Napoleon III did. By 1865, Juarez had been chased all the way to the last edge of Mexican territory across the Rio Grande from Fort Bliss. But while the French conquered territory, they had not won over the people. And all of this time, Maximilian could not understand a guerrilla war. He couldn't understand how he could win battles, but still lose the war. A member of the Belgian Legion fighting for Maximilian wrote, there is no region in Mexico where the insurrection has not suffered a defeat that would have been decisive in Europe. But here it is merely a blow inflicted by fate, which good luck will put right the next day. By 1865, it was clear that the sympathies of the Mexican people were against Maximilian. Napoleon III had made three miscalculations, the feelings of the Mexican people, the growing anti-war sentiment in France, and the sudden end of the American Civil War. He also needed his, to get his troops back into Europe. As our Civil War neared an end, several fantastic schemes came into play. On January 7, 1864, William Preston from Kentucky, who had once been the American minister to Spain, and who fought at Corinth, Shiloh, Chickamauga, and Vicksburg, was appointed as the Confederate minister to Maximilian. High hopes were attached to the Preston mission. The hope was that the South and Maximilian's government would recognize each other. Confederate Secretary of State Judah P. Benjamin went so far as to ask for an alliance, hoping to get backdoor recognition from France. 
Preston was also given authority to seek cession of, or at least free passage for Confederate troops over Mexican states. Maximilian, though, on orders from Napoleon III, dodged Preston at every turn. William Gwynn, a Mississippi plantation owner who had been a U.S. Senator from California, was convinced by 1864 that the South was going to lose the war. He pursued a plan to get Maximilian to cede Sonora to France. That land would then provide a home to slave owners who wanted to emigrate with their slaves. Maximilian, again, who had sworn not to give away any part of Mexico, refused. In another scheme, on October 29, 1864, Matthias Romero and a General Doblado, both representing Juarez, got a pass to visit Ulysses S. Grant at City Point. Grant was very sympathetic to Juarez. Grant told him he regretted his role in the Mexican War, which he wrote about later in his memoirs, and said if it was not for the Civil War, he would raise a corps of volunteers to fight for Juarez. Grant pushed the issue of Mexico with Seward and Lincoln. Seward stayed along the line of neutrality. Lincoln, who spoke no foreign languages and had never been out of the country, appeared disinterested. Another end of the war plan floated, was floated by Confederate Vice President, President Alexander H. Stevens, calling again, as Seward had at the beginning of the war, for the North and the South to intervene jointly in Mexico. Lincoln refused. Even though the French controlled nearly all of the country, the surrender of Lee threw a good scare into them. The assassination of Lincoln proved a further fear. New President Andrew Johnson was a known opponent of French intervention. He had campaigned by saying, you can get no monarchy up on this continent. The end of the Civil War meant several Confederate veterans fleeing across the Rio Grande. For some, it was survival in uncertain times. For other, it was an adventure. Confederate Joe Shelby and his command migrated to Mexico, and they had a romantic attachment to Carlotta and joined the Contra guerrillas. Rebel naval commander Matthew Fontaine Maury showed up in Mexico City. Another 12 Confederate generals, including Shelby, Hamilton B., Kirby Smith, and John Magruder went to Mexico at various times, along with five Confederate governors. It was a sizable emigre movement at the top. In the summer of 1865, no one was quite sure what rights, what opinions, and what punishment awaited former Confederates. Kirby Smith offered to fight for Maximilian. Maximilian was lukewarm toward ex-Confederates. He did not wish to anger Washington. This was a miscalculation on his part. He could have sorely used the expertise, but Maximilian was a person who never knew really which way the political winds were blowing. And he never quite realized how deeply he was despised by the Mexican people. Yet he was also never quite ruthless enough to wage an effective war. Some Union veterans did sympathize with Maximilian. A veterans group called Californians for the Legion of Honor went to fight for him. At least one German Union general, Felix Dussamson, we met his uh, wife earlier, went to fight for the French. The French Foreign Legion made an effort to sign up ex-Confederates. They got very few recruits. Most Union sentiment, however, was for the Juaristas and against the French. This was led by U.S. Grant, who quickly became the most important factor in Mexican-American relations. Grant, a liberal in politics, now sent General Phil Sheridan and 42,000 Union veterans to the Texas-Mexican border. On June 16, 1865, Grant, in a cabinet me meeting, pressed for the idea of sending a note to France asking for a withdrawal. Seward opposed this, feeling that France was likely to withdraw anyway. Stanton supported Grant. Grant arranged for 30,000 muskets to be funneled to Juarez via the troops along the border. Sheridan's men would conveniently leave piles of surplus equipment where the Juaristas could take them in. They wound up with the United States rifles, cartridges, blankets, powder. The French sent ships up the Rio Grande to try and block the ship, 
the the transshipment of uh, Union material, it did not work because the river was simply too long. Union General John Schofield wanted to fight for Juarez, but Seward sent him on a pointless mission to Paris. Wu Wallace, author of Ben Hur and veteran of Shiloh, was approached to take a command in the liberal army. It must be said that not all marked Mexican liberals wanted Union help. There was a fear that once US troops arrived and went over the border, it would be hard to get them to leave. On September 16th, is General Lou Wallace. On September 16th, 1865, Maximilian and Carlotta, childless because of his syphilis, adopted Augustin Iturbide, grandson of the former Mexican ruler, as their heir. The boy's living parents opposed this, but she was tricked. She blabbed to the New York press that her child had been abducted. Maximilian, faced with worldwide pressure, had to relent. It was another act that brought Maximilian no friends, but brought him more opponents. Maximilian, bowed, bowing to advice, issued what he called the Black Decree, which required his troops to shoot all captured guerrillas. The liberals were already doing this, Nonetheless, the proclamation earned him more condemnation. The morale of the French army was now shot. Much like our situation in Vietnam, no one wanted to fight and die for an army on the retreat. The French had sent about 40,000, 6,000 of those had died. Fully one third of the deaths were in the French Foreign Legion. Many French soldiers deserted, especially those who could cross the Rio Grande. Maximilian still had volunteers from Austria, Belgium, Spain, and even Egypt. When he went to recruit more, the United States said it would break relations with countries, then sent more troops. The liberals under Juarez now concentrated their attacks on the remaining European volunteers fighting for Maximilian. On July 9, 1866, as this began to come to an end, Carlotta left for Mexico for Europe to ask Napoleon III to leave the French troops in Mexico. On the trip, she began to show some of the symptoms of what would become a lifetime of mental instability. She awoke at midnight once and insisted on going visiting. She argued intelligently with Napoleon III, but, would, but Napoleon III would not change his mind. She bitterly called him the Prince of Darkness. Now she became unhinged and was convinced that Napoleon III was trying to kill her. She insisted only upon eating fresh chickens that she had watched being killed. Napoleon III changed his plan ever so slightly, delaying parts of the, with his withdrawal so his troops would not be overwhelmed piecemeal. On February 5th, 1867, the French army left Mexico City. General Achille Bazaine offered Maximilian a safe trip home several times, but he refused. On April 2nd, 1867, following a month long siege, General Porfirio Diaz would win the third battle of play before the Barista forces. Maximilian was now cut off from the coast. Maximilian, with 9,000 loyal volunteers and Mexican conservatives, was besieged north of Mexican, Mexico City by 35,000 troops. This battle went on until the night of May 14, 1867. Through some act of treachery, still not clear, liberal troops were let through the conservative lines. Maximilian awoke at 4 a.m. in the morning to find liberal troops in his courtyard. At first, he wished to die fighting, but convinced resistance was futile, he surrendered. The decision was made to try him, to put him on trial for his life. Princess Samsam begged for the life of her husband, Felix, who had been fighting with Maximilian, and also begged for the life of Maximilian. She tried bribery but that failed. Juarez liked Maximilian personally, but would not spare his life. If all the 
kings and queens of Europe were in your place, I would not spare that life. It is not I who take it, it is the people and the law. While Princess Samsam's husband was freed, Maximilian's death sentence stood. He was condemned to die June, January 25th, under the January 25th, 1862 de decree that said anyone helping the invasion was subject to death. Maximilian, along with two of his major generals, was sentenced to be shot. Several countries, including the United States, asked Mexico to spare Maximilian. Juarez reasoned that if Maximilian was left alive, he would be the focus of continuing efforts to overthrow the liberal government. On June 6th, June 6th, take it back, at 6 a.m. June 19th, wearing a black coat and white hat, Maximilian was executed under a cloudless blue sky. Speaking in Spanish, he told his execu executioners, I forgive everybody. I pray that everyone may also forgive me, and I wish that my blood, which is now to be shed, will be for the good of the country. Long live Mexico. Long live independence. In the French assembly, Napoleon's, Napoleon's spokesman simply said of Maximilian, God did not want it, let us respect his decrees. It was to Maximilian's concessions that he owed the loss of his scepter. Reaction across Europe and across this country was mixed, along the lines you might expect. The Confederates still in Mexico were purged by the Juaristas, the lucky ones left in time or were allowed to leave. Juarez, unfortunately, did not enjoy the fruits of his victory very long. He was reelected in 1871, but died of a heart attack July 18th, 1872. Today, his birthday is a Mexican holiday, and he is revered everywhere as the savior of his country. Felix and Agnes Samson returned to Europe. He joined the Prussian army, then died at the Battle of Gravelot during the Franco-Prussian War. The princess would remarry, live another 42 years and write her memoirs, the stirring tale of a couple that fought in three wars across two continents. Porfirio Diaz opposed Juarez. He seized power in a coup in 1876 and ruled Mexico in one way or another until 1911. He died in Paris in 1915 where he is still buried. He remains a highly controversial figure in Mexican history. Throughout his long reign, he became known as the Republican monarch. He suppressed the press, modernized the army, and centralized the government. He played fast and loose with democracy, stopping elections when it suited him, and electing close allies over others. He remained in power until well past the age of 80. He is, ironically, the pragmatic and compromising leader Maximilian might have been, devoted above all to the cause of staying in power. Napoleon III was defeated in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, emigrated to England and died only three years later. His wife, Empress Eugenie, outlived him by 47 years, dying in Madrid in 1920. As befits, someone who uh, was not quite fond of her own husband, they had only one child, the Prince Imperial. The Prince Imperial of France, hoping to get military training, volunteered for the British Army, and was killed in South Africa in 1879 by the Zulus. Reportedly, Carlotta suffered from some form of mental illness for the last half century of her life. For years, she would get on a boat every morning and ask, when are we going to Mexico? Was she clinically depressed or worse? She never remarried. An oft-repeated story was that the widowed Carlotta had an affair with Alfred van der Smissen and that she gave birth to Maxim Wagon, who rose to command the French army at the outset of World War II. Wagon 
supposedly the only child of Empress Carlotta. Wei Gan said in interviews that he never knew who his parents were. Whether that was true or not, Carlotta lived until 1927. It was said that she placed a curse on all of those who had failed to help her husband. If so, it came to pass. She lived long enough to see all the dynasties of Europe, the Romanovs, the Hohenzollerns, the Bonapartes and the Habsburgs be overthrown. She died January 19th, 1927 at an obscure castle in Belgium. Isolated from the world, the castle was accessible only by going over a moat. Her death was the last act in a tragedy, a tragedy for her family, a tragedy for the royalty of Europe, and most of all, a tragedy for the people of Mexico. Today, only the Mexicans remember who she is, and not particularly fondly, on the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo.